Welcome to a special TCU panel discussion. We have an amazing panel got, uh, lined up for you all today. Uh, my name is Brandon Kitchen, and I will serve as your moderator, along with Ms. Tracy Williams. We'll be discussing the TCU Magazine Summer 2021 cover story that honors the memory of Mr. Fred Rouse, the only documented lynching in Tarrant County in Fort Worth history. It's also important that in today's conversation, we keep in mind that yesterday and today are very connected. In order for us to understand the complex issues of today, we must embrace the past, good, bad, and ugly, and understand what happened so we can heal and build a better community in the future. So with that said, I wanna go ahead and introduce our panel. Our first panelist to the far right on the couch is Adam W. McKinney. He serves as assistant professor of dance in TCU School for Classical and Contemporary Dance. He is the co-founder and co-director of DNA Works, along with his husband, Dr. Daniel Banks, and he also serves as a president and founding member of Tarrant County Coalition for Peace and Justice, also known as TCCBJ. Our second panelist on my end here is Fred Rouse III. He is the grandson of Mr. Fred Rouse, and he serves on the executive board for TCCBJ. Our final panelist is Miss Opal Lee. She was born in Marshall, Texas, and made the move with her family to Fort Worth when she was 10 years old. She's an educator, counselor, and civil rights activist. She's widely recognized as the grandmother of Juneteenth. After a lifetime of advocacy and mobilizing many to walk alongside her in her walk to the nation's capital, Ms. Opal finally got to see her wish and vision come true. This past June 17th, 2021, President Joe Biden signed into law Juneteenth National Independence Day commemorating the abolition of slavery and celebrating the freedom of the enslaved. I just wanna say, Ms. Opal, we thank and applaud you for your leadership and dedication to ensure this gonna be possible. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So glad you could be here. And finally, our last guest and co-moderator is Ms. Tracy Williams. She is a 2004 and 2008 graduate of TCU. She currently serves as a president of the TCU National Alumni Association and as a member of the Board of Trustees. Professionally, she is the VP of Learning and Development at Valence Community, where the mission is to create new paths to success for black professionals. Throughout the discussion, she will be reading questions from the audience, so please comment as we go along. History is not a relic in our book. It continues to shape the ways in which we interact and evolve in our everyday lives, and this can be especially true for people from marginalized communities who deal with disparities in just about every facet of 21st century existence. As I think about 2020 and 2021, there was a lot that will be remembered forever. It's COVID-19 taking way too many lives prematurely and halting the way that we live. That's the social justice issues and the attention that's been brought towards those, namely the Black Lives Matter movement and issue of police brutality. Names such as George Floyd and Breonna Taylor echoed every corner of our nation and beyond through news coverage, protests, and social media. And more locally here in Fort Worth, we remember Tatiana Jefferson, but also now Fred Rouse, um, even though he was well before our time. Personally, as a journalism student and 2018 graduate of TCU, I was very passionate when it came to learning civil rights history and writing about social justice issues on campus and in Fort Worth. Yet, it wasn't until last year TCU Magazine reached out to me and told me about Fred Rouse to write this story. And I'll be honest, it, I was floored to find out that there was a lynching in our city, that I couldn't find that. Um, I still question how I didn't know, but I'm glad he's getting his name, Fred Rouse, and this story is getting the attention that it rightfully deserves now. As the author of this cover story, I'll admit it wasn't an easy process to write. As I began to learn more about the history of Fort Worth and about the fate of Mr. Fred Rouse and what happened to his family, it was, it was honestly very painful. And also as a black man in America, getting to see the news every single day was exhausting, it was tiring, it was depressing. And I often question and still do how much progress we've made in this nation, if any at all. But what kept me grounded was knowing I had an opportunity and a responsibility to use my gifts to help amplify a story that's been needed to be told for a long time. So I wanna thank you all tuning in today and for all the readers across the country and um, for taking the time to read my story. It really means a lot to me. If you haven't already read it, you can do so at uh, magazine.tcu.edu. It's entitled, Can a Lynching Spark Change? 
Um, you all are spreading his name like wildfire. Um, after just six weeks of being live, it's already been the most read story TC Magazine has had in, in almost three years. So thank you for that. Lastly, before we dive in, I'd just like to thank the many partners who helped bring this panel to life. It wouldn't be possible without you guys. That's the university, TCU Magazine, TCU Alumni Association, TCU Journalism Department, TCU Marketing and Communication, DNA Works, Tarrant County Coalition for Peace and Justice, Unity Unlimited Incorporated, and last but certainly not least, the Rouse family. So to provide some background for what we'll be talking about today, I'm gonna to show a brief video. You cannot walk away from this experience today and not act. You are expected to act after you learn about the life and legacy of our dear Mr. Fred Rouse. Fort Worth lynching tour honoring the memory of Mr. Fred Rouse is a bike and car tour to the sites associated with the lynching of Mr. Fred Rouse, which occurred on Sunday, December 11th, 1921. My name is Fred Rouse III, and um, Mr. Fred Rouse is my grandfather. The very first time I took the tour, it, it was, it was heart-wrenching. Um, I could not believe that somebody would do this, not only to my grandfather, but to any human. It just broke my heart. Mr. Fred Rouse was a non-union strike breaker in the Nile City Stockyards. And when he left work on Tuesday, December 6th, 1921, he had to walk through a throng of white picketers. Uh, that evening, he was attacked and left for dead in the stockyards. The police officers put him in the back of the car. They thought he was dead. In fact, he was alive and rose up from the back seat. And so they drove him to 4th and Jones Street, the former city and county hospital. And he recovered there from his wounds, which included stab wounds. Uh, and his skull was fractured in two places, along with internal injuries. And on the evening of December 11th, 1921, he was kidnapped from the hospital and uh, was driven to uh, the site of the lynching, which is at Northeast 12th Street and Samuels Avenue, and was murdered there at approximately 11.15 that evening. As long as I've lived here, I I've never heard of, about this story. And so I had to come out here and, and learn more about it and really just educate myself so that I can educate other people about the story. At TCU, we talk about the university being the University of Fort Worth. If we're gonna be the University of Fort Worth, we have to tell these types of stories. I come to this work with a sense of responsibility and with a sense that change can actually happen in our lifetimes. What this work has meant for me is that um, I also get to invite others to take leadership in the change that we want to see here in Fort Worth. And I see it happening. Hundreds of people have participated in this tour, and we hope that in the future, hundreds more will also have an opportunity to move through these spaces to better understand uh, the effect of racism on our current communities. They thought they killed the man, Fred Rouse. They thought they killed the name, Fred Rouse. And they thought they killed his legacy. But that was only the beginning, because a hundred years later, not only are people still honoring the name Fred Rouse, but a living witness, I'm standing here, I'm Fred Rouse III, and I also have a son, and his name is Fred Rouse IV. With them executing my grandfather back then only sparked the beginning, because 100 years later, his name and his legacy still lives on to this day. I hope you all enjoyed that video. I want to give credit to Amy Peterson who made that video. Um, it's amazing. So before we dive in, just want to put another plug in for the audience. We'll be doing questions um, as we talk. Well, I'll be doing questions. Tracy will, will also be checking her iPad and we'll make sure to get you guys in on the action. So let's dive in. Um, start with Adam. When you made the move to Fort Worth, why well, take it upon yourself to unearth this painful story of what happened to Mr. Fred Rouse? Thanks, Brandon. I'm a dancer and an artist. And so the way in which I engage the world is through art. Um, I did my master's work looking at the physical effects and manifestations of racism. What does racism do to our bodies and what does it do to our communities as a whole? 
And so when I came to Fort Worth, um, knowing that I was moving to the South, um, I assumed that there may have been a racial terror lynching here, and I did not have to go far. The racial terror lynching of Mr. Fred Rouse that took place in 1921 was well documented in Fort Worth Star-Telegram articles from 1921 and 1922. I'm happy to cite uh, Tim Madigan's article from 2002 uh, in which Mr. Robert Rouse, the nephew of Mr. Fred Rouse and his son, Mr. Robert Rouse Jr. are featured as well as the 2018 Bud Kennedy article about the racial terror lynching of Mr. Fred Rouse. And it made me question um, why, because it had been well documented, do we not know about it? And for me, it's representative of all the ways in which our Black stories are not centralized as part of the greater narrative of the place in which we live. And so my interest as a researcher was to um, use the arts as a way to bring the story uh, forward. Thank you. And I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, stories, uh, Black stories are kind of buried. And so that's why I want to segue to you, Fred. You found out about your grandfather last year. I mean, you're, you're a full grown adult with a life and kids. Yeah. So take yeah. us back to the moment you realized this was your grandfather, why didn't you find out pre, uh, well before any time in your life? Um, well, th thanks for asking that question, Brandon. Uh, for me, my biological dad died when I was 12 years old. So um, I'm thinking because he was older and because the, 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 uh, the tragedy of what happened to his father, he never told anybody uh, in our family. So nobody knew. So um, as I got older, I, I never knew if I had any other family, you know, outside of my dad, other than my aunt, um, which they lived down in Houston. And so as an adult, I, I just never knew. And so then uh, last year is when I got the phone call uh, from Adam and you guys and, um, saying that you had found my grandfather. And um, once we confirmed that, you know, Mr. Fred Rouse was actually my grandfather and finding out exactly how he got killed uh, was, such a, was such a tragic thing to hear mm -hmm. uh, from me and my family. Um, and even today, it's still hard to process, you know, not only, you know, how horrible, um, you know, the tragedy is that they did to my grandfather, but, you know, that anybody can be so hateful and, you know, and, and, and hang somebody from a tree and shoot them and stab them and have that much hatred for somebody, you know, uh, it's, it's just terrible. Um, so I can say even today, you know, it's still painful to even talk about it. It's still, you know, but I know that through talking about it, it's 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 healing mm -hmm. because it also uncovers other families that have gone through the same tragedy. Yes. And, you know, those tragedies may also have been swept under the rug or, you know, nobody talked about it. But now uh, it brings about a conversation. So I think that's that's important. I'm glad to hear that. And And now that you are aware of this knowledge, how are you trying to integrate that to, you know, influence the future? And have you also been able to locate new family members? Yeah, right now, uh, one of the things that have that, you know, I've joined is the Tarrant County Coalition for Peace and Justice mm -hmm. um, so that I can be, you know, uh, an advocate, uh, like I say, for other families that have also gone through this tragedy of racial terror, you know, terror violence. Um, and through finding out who my grandfather was, like I was saying, you know, since my biological dad died when I was 12, you know, you know, he never talked about or never said anything about other family members. So through this process, I have found out that I have other family um, here in Fort Worth. Wow. wow. And, uh, you know, and, you know, for the first time ever. And I've been in Dallas for 25 years and I never knew that I had family, you know, 15 minutes down the street. And so I did get a chance to meet my cousin, you know, for the first time, Mr. Robert Rouse. And uh, when I first met him, the the resemblance to me was was striking uh he looks like me he looks like my dad's sister so we had a real good conversation and uh you know i'm just glad to know that i, that I now know that i have family in fort worth and that family is constantly growing so i'm glad to hear that so now this release for anybody we we've kind of found a common theme and that's bearing tough generational trauma um that's very prevalent in a lot of 
communities of color, especially in the black community. Can we speak a little bit more about, you know, that? Uh, Ms. Opal, I want to maybe go to you. You've been in Fort Worth um, and you've seen it grow and, and there was an attack on your house back in 1939. Um, how, how have you began to heal from that over time and you continue to share that story with us? Well, <clears throat> if you have work to do, if you don't think about your problems and you help somebody else, you just sort of push it to the back. There's so much that needs to be done. And my parents, after what happened to us on the 19th day of June in 1939, where my parents had just bought a house, we'd been there a week, and the neighbors gathered, 500 strong, the papers said. There was police there, but they couldn't control the mob, the papers said. When my dad got home with a gun, the police told him, if you bust a cap, we'll let the mob have you. Well, my parents sent us to friends several blocks away, and they left under cover of darkness, but not before they began to throw things at the house, and then they went in and pulled out the furniture and burned it and burned the house down. My parents never, ever talked with us about it at all. They worked and worked and worked some more and bought another home. I don't know if that's a catalyst for the work that I've done, but I just know that if those people had given us an opportunity to live and work and play in that neighborhood, they'd have found we wanted the same thing they did, a decent place to stay, decent schools. They were segregated, but ours were the best. Um, they'd have found out that my da dad had a job that was paying enough for us to live on at that time. We, we wanted the same things they wanted, but they never gave us a chance. Um, the lot's vacant now, and I wanted to buy it to put another house on it. I want somebody to live there to show the neighborhood, and it has transitioned. It's yeah. not all white now that people can live together and work together and play together and attend church together. And we're all one people. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm preaching that almost, that each of us, each of us is a should be a committee of one to teach that if somebody can be taught to hate, they can be taught to love. That's right. And so that's what we are about, getting people. And just think, if the 1.5 million people who gave us signatures for that Juneteenth petition, we almost had 3 million. If those people would change the minds of some other people, we'd be so much farther along than we are. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm wondering if people realize that France sent the Statue of Liberty to the United States as a gift after the Civil War, as if to say, you're at a turning point now, you know, longer a slave holding nation. You can begin to make yourself the greatest country in the world, except we didn't listen. And we had all kinds and we still have all kinds of problems. Do you know France has sent another 
Statue of Liberty to the United States. They call her Little Sister. She's not nearly as large as the first statue. The first statue has shackles, broken shackles on her left foot. And it seems to me that France is saying, you're turning another point, mm. another corner. You need to get rid of your racism and people have had enough and you ought to be about healing. I don't understand why people don't know that you need to know what happened so that you can heal from it and go on with the rest of your lives. Well, I'm going to keep on walking and keep on talking till that happens. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, Ms. Opal. Thank you. And I want to come right back to you and ask you, is it, does it feel real yet that Juneteenth is now a national holiday? And what was your visit like to the White House in that whole entire week? Listen, I was, I was just overjoyed. I was humbled. I don't even know the words to explain how I felt being there. But to think that a little old lady from Marshall, Texas could make it to the White House and talk to the President of the United States, it tells me that this can happen for anyone. Yes, ma'am. And that we have so much to learn and so much that we can do to help the president and the vice president to make this a really great country. Thank you, Ms. Opal. And this follow-up here is, while we do, people are celebrating the fact that it is recognized now, people are also still critical of the timing, which feels all too much like performative activism. You know, Black Americans have been asking for reparations, please reform. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing government action that's trying to suppress voting rights and the thorough examination and education of our nation's history through a critical lens of race, also known as critical race theory. So in your eyes, and then I'll ask, I want to go to Adam and Fred as well, does this feel like a real victory? Is it a symbolic victory? Is it just a step in the direction of progress? It's a step. It's a step of oh, victory. And, and we've got momentum and we need to keep it. We need to be able to address homelessness and joblessness and health care that some can get and some can't. And um, the criminal justice system, that pipeline from the schools to the prison, all these things have to be addressed, climate change. And we can do it. And we should be doing it together as opposed to what we are doing now. Yeah, and, I, and I definitely think that it's a, a step in, in the right direction. Um, but at the same time, even though um, everything has been signed, we have Juneteenth as, as a federal holiday now, you still have those opposers, those people that are still trying to oppress everything. They want to change the voting laws because they fear that, you know, the minorities, the black people, uh, other, or other cultures are going to be taken over. So they want to keep the same old ways of how things used to be and they fear the change. I agree with you, but again, it's up to us to change their minds. Exactly. And you have to do it one person at a time. That's true. Um, I, I just know that it can be done. Ms. Opal, your work reminds me of a quote by a rabbi whose name is Rabbi Schneerson. The quote is, if you are the one who sees the problem, then you are the one who is divinely inspired to fix that problem, right? And of course, we're not there yet. Oh, we're not. We don't have the solution. The problems are much larger than the skills that we have to deal with the issue. But unless we take critical action, both personally and communally, we won't see the change that, that we want to see in the world. I keep saying we got no guns. All we got are minds, and some of them are real good, you know. And this tech stuff that you young people have, use it to your advantage. 
I can at least use the cell phone. But I'm learning. But we all need to put our shoulder to the wheel, as they say, and get on with the business of making our nation whole. Good nation, but it's broken in places. And it needs to be made whole. And we can do it. Thank you, Ms. Opal. Ms. Opal and Mr. Ralph and Professor McKinney, you all have, to me, brought up this idea of the power of one, the power of one individual, the power of one mind who can truly make a difference. And we've seen it in the work that you've done, Ms. Mm -hmm. Opal, in inspiring change, not only in our local community, but nationally and globally as we see this story and the impact that you're having um, take off. It's interesting to me because given what Brandon has been saying around people who are looking for additional change and they're, they're wanting to see more, what would you say to anyone who is watching who has taken some individual steps, but they might be growing a little bit weary. They might be growing a little tired in in the cause because you have shown us what tenacity and perseverance looks yes, like. So yeah. what what message do you have to anyone who is individually taking on that responsibility? That if it's a passion, you can't let it go. You got to go and you not it's not gonna be easy. You're going to get discouraged, but I, I know from a child, my mom was one of 19 brothers and sisters. My grandma had three sets of twins, but my grandfather was a circuit riding minister and he saw things that others had that he wanted for his community, like tennis courts and golf and indoor plumbing and all that kind of stuff. When he lost a house by fire and built another house, he built a bathroom in it. We still had to go to that big black wash pot, put that water in, get that bucket, take it to that tin tub in that bathroom. But I'm saying that to say that my mom said I was more like him than any of the other of his 19 children. If he tackled something, it got done. Mm -hmm. And everybody in that neighborhood would go to Reverend Broadus with their problems and he would help them. He didn't have any more than they did. Maybe he did have a little more 19 children, but all I'm saying is, you've got to hold on to and do what you know is best. And don't let anything turn you around. I believe that. And I believe people can get more done working together than what's happening with us now. If I may, in terms of the story of Mr. Fred Rouse, um, well, first, I think I'd like to say, keep going, yeah. right? <laughs> if you stop, you stop your thinking, and it's your it's your job to, to <laughs> figure it out and That's to keep fine. going and to go down the rabbit hole. So in right. terms of the story of Mr. Fred Rouse, there were holes in the story. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking about who is in charge of whose narratives. Um, I'd like to bring in the spirit of Ida B. Wells, who documented racial yes. fear lynchings during her time. And what I found is that most often our experiences as people of the global majority are often written by um, people of European heritage. And I think that that was true in terms of the story of Mr. Fred Rao, which also left holes for us to go down and to try to exhume the story. And what came forth were people and ancestors and possibility and legacy. Look, let me raise your ear with Adam. And in my research, as I was writing the story, there's more news coverage on the Star Telegram about the two brothers, white men who were shot 
when they attack Fred Rouse and they even talk about Fred Rouse and his family. And so I thought that was striking in, you know, 1921, right, December, and then you backtrack to the summer, 1921, Tulsa, you know, Black, yeah. Black Wall Street. You can find newspaper reports and blurbs from that time, and it does the same exact thing. They don't mention about the families. They don't mention about the kids. They don't mention about the fact that, you know, the, the whole concept of how the riot, quote unquote, started, that there was a bomb drop, that, you know, they started the fight first. It wasn't the Black community, but it's recorded history a different way. So, and, and that's the one thing to interject. And that's, I think, is a way that they keep control. You know, since they control the narrative, they control the information that gets out to the public. And that way they can control everything. You know, so that's, that's one of the things I was thinking about. Too. There's so much that's still uncovered. I know I've heard stories of a lynching tree in the area where Nash Elementary School, that community, there was a lynching tree there. That's not where they carried Mr. Rouse, but they said there were others who were lynched, whites and black, on that tree. Whether it's still there or not, I don't know. There are so many stories that have not been told. What happened to my parents, what happened to us, would have happened to others, except they armed themselves. There's a story in that neighborhood on Judkin Street, and that's where I live, where a minister, he passed away recently, over 100 years old, his wife and small child. People gathered at their house, and they were ready to do, he fired outside in that crowd, and they dispersed and he hit somebody's radiator. That man came to him later to say, I'm sorry, I had no business in the neighborhood. They became friends. There's so much that can be done. I just wish I could do more, but I'm gonna keep on walking and talking. You have done a lot, that's for sure. It's amazing when I hear you say, I wish I could do, yeah, I could do like, more with wow. all that you've already done. <laughs> Look how late I got started. It's okay. It was yeah. perfect timing. Yeah, right on time. I do want to say that we've begun touching on, or begun answering a question that has come from someone in our audience of what we do know about historical, what you've learned about historical racism in your in your own personal experiences and how has that fueled what you've been doing in this fight for a federal holiday and other um justices i don't know that i got any feelings about it mm. i just know that there's work to be done mm. and i know when it comes up you try to alleviate it the best way you can and it pays not to get angry mm. because mm. if you do you lose perspective. You get all out of kelter, the older folk would say. You simply have to decide that this is your goal and you're not going to let them rattle you. You're just going to do what has to be done. Fred, I want to go, go for it. Okay. Um, Fred, I want to go to you. <laughs> and um, you know, I, I'm aware that you are on the executive board of PCCPJ, um, and you're on the Parks Committee, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. So can you entail what that means? Because I think it's going to be a good um, bounce back of what we were just talking about. Yeah, I think for, for me, for being on the Parks Committee, um, it's a committee right now with the Tarrant County Coalition for Peace and Justice. And what we're striving to do is um, create a park, uh, a memorial park for, Mr., for my grandfather, Mr. Fred Rouse. And in creating that park, it's going to be a community uh, memorial park um, for everybody to come and, and hear his story and also uh, to, to, to create some type of healing uh, for the community. Um, so we're working on that now. And um, later on this year, I think December this year, this is the 100 year anniversary of him being um, lynched. And uh, we're going to have the, the groundbreaking for that. Um, so right now we're definitely, you know, in works of getting designs together to create the park. We already have the land for it. Uh, it's, and it's the exact same place that he was lynched at. 
So uh, we're working right now to get that together. So. And you need to know that the groups of nonprofits who are trying to acquire 1012 North Main Street, that this is a building that was built by the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. And we, because I'm part of that, want to make it something positive. Mm -hmm. And so, if you got a way to help us, we'd be glad to have you. Yeah. And this is all a part of a revisioning plan around transforming traumatic sites into sites of healing, community, and possibility. So for example, in terms of Fred Rouse Memorial Park, that's a partnership with the Rainwater Charitable Foundation, a local foundation that has gifted Tarrant County Coalition for Peace and Justice with a grant to transform that site from one of trauma into healing. And in terms of the former Ku Klux Klan Auditorium at 1012 North Main Street and the leadership of Ms. Opal and myself and Dr. Daniel Banks and many other people, uh, transforming that particular site into what will be known as the Fred Rouse Center and Museum for Arts and Community Healing. And so we're going through a process of um, community awareness and community design of what healing can look like locally. And a shout out to the Projects Group and Mass Design Group and the Ford Foundation that has funded 1012 North Main Street um, to hire uh, folks to start building that plan around um, uh, development and uh, visioning. What I love about this is it reminds me of the press conference that the um, Attorney General had after Derek Chauvin's sentencing last week. Last the, week. One, the one statement that stood out to me, and he said it multiple times, was you can't heal a dirty wound. And what I love about the work you all are doing is you're taking what we see as visible wounds in this city and you're transforming them into something that can lead to the reconciliation and the healing and the peace that we need in order to move forward that serves as that bridge to additional action and additional justice and change. So thank you for the work that you all are leading. So, you know, you're, you're seeing what was a former lynching site, the tree's gone, and now the grandson is helping actively to get that park installed. It'll be a monument forever. That recognizing that's healing. We're seeing the largest Ku Klux Klan hall ever built that's still standing, hopefully will be turned into a museum and an arts facility and a community healing space. This is major, right? We are, this is tangible work that we can see with our eyes happening right now. So Adam, I wanna ask you what other um, parts are there to this memorial project? And are there actual ways that people can contribute, donate, all the things? Absolutely. Well, first, I'd just like to say that Fort Worth can do this. That if anybody can do this, we have all the resources we need here in Fort Worth. We have all the key players in line to make our vision for healing in our city happen. Um, at this point, we do not yet own the former Klan Auditorium. Uh, we're working with the principal owner to, in, and we are in conversation uh, with his representative around what it will mean to purchase the building and to create a long-term plan around sustainability uh, for the bil building, which includes a design uh, process and a capital campaign. Folks can go to transform1012.org. We also have a Facebook page, it's called uh, 1012 uh, North Main Street, uh, Transform 1012 North Main Street, mm -hmm. and also check out dnaworks.org. Uh, as Fred mentioned, we are working on programming um, for the centenary anniversary of the racial terror lynching of Mr. Fred Rouse, which will, uh, that programming will happen on the site of the lynching and across Fort Worth in our various and diverse uh, communities. So our vision for healing is a clear one. The pathway is illuminated and we are walking down that path hand in hand together. It's amazing. And then the, the uh, other element to it, the Fort Worth lynching tour, um, you all had an amazing season, a round of tours um, earlier this spring. Um, would you care to share perspectives, comments that you received from participants 
would you view it as a success? And can we, or the people expect to see more tours? How is that looking for the future? Mm -hmm. So uh, our program is entitled Fort Worth Lynching Tour Honoring the Memory of Mr. Fred Rouse. And it's a bike and car tour to four of the sites associated with the racial terror lynching. Uh, and I think the, uh, the response that we've heard most often is, I knew nothing about this history. Why do I know nothing about this history? And I pass by this building or this site every day. Mm. And, uh, you know, there's anger, there's sadness, there's a disappointment. But I think also there's hope and possibility there. Mm. So we'll be bringing back Fort Worth Lynching Tour, honoring the memory of Mr. Fred Rouse, which also includes an augmented reality uh, app. Ms. Opal, you were talking about technology. And so we're using technology to get the story out to as many people as possible. Um, we'll be holding that tour in December, and then we'll bringing, be bringing it back in spring 2022. Well, I told Fred that in my neighborhood, there's a street named Rouse, and we need to know why it was named Rouse, and who's responsible? What's the story behind that in Riverside is where it is. Okay. All right, Facebook Live, <laughs> charging you Help to do out. some research. <laughs> why is Rouse Street in the Riverside neighborhood called Rouse Street? <clears throat> Lastly, before we get to a question from the, from the audience, Fred, I know you got to experience that tour with your family. Can you share what it was like to visit the sites associated with your grandfather's lynching? Um, for me, um, visiting those different sites and, and, and just knowing and hearing about the story, uh, it was heartbreaking. Um, you know, to, to actually follow the process or follow uh, the, the line, so to speak, that my grandfather walked and where he worked and where he was killed and, you know, in the hospital that he was taken to, um, it was heartbreaking. Um, but I'm, but I'm glad I got a chance to be a part of it because it's, it's a part, it's, it's a chance to heal from it. And, I, and for me, um, I'm just so thankful for all the many people um, that came out to support it, uh, that's still supporting it to this day. Um, um, all of the administrators that, you know, put it together. Uh, it's just overwhelming. So on, on one side, it's heartbreaking. And on the other side, it's amazing to see the process happen. Okay. Tracy, you have any questions? So we do have some questions. And one of, and one of the pieces that Brandon asked me to uh, bring up is why is this so critical for our larger TCU community to be a part of not only the understanding and the awareness <coughs> of the story of your grandfather, Fred, but also understanding the stories that are local to Fort Worth, but also have a national and global impact. and one of the things that I keep coming back to is that as students and alumni of this university, we've been charged with one thing, and that is to be ethical leaders and responsible citizens of our global community. And for me personally, the only way I can do that is if I am fully aware and knowledgeable of our history, because if we know what it is, we can work towards not repeating it. So my first question to all of you is when it comes to continuing the conversation, Ms. Opal, you have talked about how there are so many stories that are untold. What charge would you give to our global community who's watching to be a part of either uncovering what these stories are, understanding what the story is, and then being able to be a part of the change and i know that's a three-part <laughs> three-part question but if we could take that first part first what role do we play in uncovering the history and telling the story i think it's about knowing and telling the truth and i'm thinking about the work of the race and reconciliation awesome. initiative here at tcu chaired by dr frederick gooding of the honors college john b roach honors college and i uh, we're here at the Kelly Alumni Center. There are uh, yearbooks around this room, and this is a yearbook from 1919, wow. Hornfrog 1919. Mm -hmm. 
and what uh, the RRI committee has um, kind of unearthed uh, here in this yearbook <clears throat> is this statement and something that occurred uh, that year of 1918, 1919 on campus. And it reads, yes, the Ku Klux Klan certainly was revived. That was the finest shirt tail parade we ever saw. Wow. And so there was a Ku Klux Klan chapter on and campus. rally here on campus. Activity maybe is the best word, the year 1918 and 1919. Mm. And so we wow. have to understand um, that these ideologies, however, and sometimes seen as um, juvenile performances that don't mean anything, right. are embedded mm -hmm. in the cultural fabric of our experience as horn frogs and as Americans. And not to say that the university now supports any of these ideologies now, because exactly. I think that that is, uh, it, it's true that the university does not. But we have to know the truth so that then we can reconcile. We also yes. don't have a sense that Fort Worth had one of the largest Klan memberships in the United States in the 1920s. And so I think about how um, uh, Mr. Rouse's family members are still here. Then, thus, uh, the family members of those who are Klan members must still be here in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And so I welcome all of us to continue to learn and to tell the truth so that we know what we're talking about and so that we can develop some creative solutions to the historical and contemporary problems. And I think one of the things, too, is because those families, we're all still here that pain is still there, you know, and it was never resolved because like with the story, it was swept under the rug. Um, and so many people on the tour and, and, and even myself, it was never talked about, you know, so, so the pain is still there, the tragedy is still there. But I think in all of our work that we're doing, we're finally bringing healing to the community, healing to our families, you know, both sides. So. And it's just not our families that need healing those who were responsible, their families need healing. And until we can understand that we both got this to do, then let's do it and get on with the business of making this the country we want it to be. And the city. So powerful to bring about that understanding of all sides needing, needing healing because yes. I think yeah. a lot of times what happens is we only focus on one group who is asking for the healing or asking for the reconciliation, but we don't acknowledge that in order for full reconciliation and healing to occur, all sides have to be exposed and all sides have to be willing to participate and take part That's in true. that healing. And That's one of true. the things that I can appreciate about the work of the Race and Reconciliation Initiative and that Dr. Gooding is leading is that this first step of uncovering the history and uncovering the truth and being honest about that has led to some incredible recommendations and work and, and action that we can take as a university in order to accomplish just what you mentioned, Ms. Opal, of all sides being healed and mm -hmm. all sides being a part of the change and the action that the majority of us want to see. Mm -hmm. So thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the repercussions of memory mm -hmm. right? and the conversation around critical race theory. And one of the justifications used to oppose uh, teaching and even thinking about critical race theory is that um, people don't wanna feel bad mm -hmm. or we don't wanna be reminded that we feel bad, right. mm -hmm. but we already feel bad. Everyone already feels bad about this history. And trauma theorists remind us that we have to go back to the site of the wound and replace old memories with new ones. I, you know, I, I talk about this work with my brother David, and he says, when has uh, forgetting ever worked? Never. Never. Right. And Never. I think about the oppressed versus the oppressors, right? You know, I look at you, look at me, we 
we don't quite see eye to eye. You think things of me, but you don't even know why you think things like those things of me. It's either been ingrained, normalized, your parents taught you, the grandparents <laughs> putting your parents, and it's a cycle, right? We just keep on repeating. But if we're able to, you know, find that common ground and then acknowledge what the facts are, then we can we can walk together. But too many times, you know, for example, as a black man, right? Like my pain and struggle and me talking about it at your inconvenience is not good enough for you, for you to keep being silent. Mm -hmm. I need you to help me. I can do what I can and I can mobilize my community, but until those people who hold the powers above us decide to say, we want to help you too. And because it's, it's, we should talk about it. We're, we're silent. Like 50 years from now, when I, when I'm an adult and have kids, are we having the same conversation that we should have, you know, we should no longer be having. So that's what I think about. Well, right now, there's a vacant lot where our house stood, and I want to buy that lot. I can buy that lot, but I have done some digging, and I can't find who owns it. I go all the way to New York, and they, the phone numbers I have, they're telling me, please don't call me again, which means they don't know anything about it. And I wish if somebody knew who owns a lot at 940, East Annie Street would let me know because I want to build in the neighborhood. I want to show people that we can be good neighbors. I don't think it's too late for that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's one thing too, you know, it's, it's never too late. And, and, and we all have a voice. You know, even sometimes we think that our voices are, are silent or nobody's listening, no matter how loud we scream, nobody can hear us. But just keep on with your voice and keep with that same passion and that same purpose. And one day, your voice will be heard. I have, based on what you just said, now I have one last <laughs> question for you all because it's so, I think it's so important. We've been talking about the use of the use of our voices and the and not giving up and to continue this work but we've also touched on how important it is for everyone to be involved mm -hmm. in this work so mm -hmm. i have a specific question for you all on the role of allies in this work and what would you what message do you have for those who want to walk with us and work with us and how they should be using their voice and their collective power in the walk that we're still on, the journey we're still on towards healing and reconciliation and change. I want to say that we need to embrace them and let them know how much we appreciate them and let them know that they can tell others and get others to be a part of what we're doing. We'd be delighted if there were people available right now who and there's enough money in this town to do anything we want to do so somebody step up so we could have the building at 1012 north main street there are others who are helping and we're grateful for their help but mention it to somebody else in your circle who can do this and I got my own things I'm doing that you can help with too. So <laughs> look me up. I'm interested in, well, <laughs> thanks for that 10, yes, 12 man, plug, Ms. So Opal. Yes. <laughs> Making it happen. I bought a t-shirt today, by the way. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm interested in reframing the idea of, uh, or even the word ally. And I think it's uh, uh, Pastor Kiev Tatum, mm who reminds us to think about um, partnership as co-conspirating mm -hmm. and to welcome co-conspirators mm -hmm. in the work uh, around creating revolutionary action. Mm -hmm. And I think that now is the time, Ms. Opal, you invited people to come in and to use their voice and mm -hmm. to use their personal and collective wisdom to enact change. And I think you're right. We're at a particular tipping point in history when we get to get it right. And it takes everybody. So I think it's also about knowing when to step up 
and knowing when to step back and to take ego out of it. Mm -hmm. Because the work, while personal, mm -hmm. while I feel this work on a personal level, it can't be about me. And it's not only about Miss Opal. And I think that that's something you do so beautifully that you welcome hundreds of thousands of people and millions of people to walk with you mm -hmm. and to walk the talk with you. And the work that you are doing, Mr. Rouse, in terms of your, your uh, reconciling that history with your family, that you feel it personally, but it's an opportunity to welcome people to, um, to make change. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for me, that, that's what feels important. We're on a roll. We're going to get things done. Amen. And I just hope it's soon. Yes, ma'am. We shouldn't wait another year or two, three. We do need to do things now. Yes, ma'am. Fred, let me ask you this question. I think we're getting close to time. And, and this may be something that you ponder for the next couple months as we approach the 100th anniversary of your grandfather's lynching. But what do you imagine he's thinking and feeling right now, open heaven? seeing all this stuff happen in his name and in, in his city? I think um, for my grandfather, I think he's, he's proud um, and he's happy to see that what they tried to do to him then, they didn't accomplish it. Um, as far as trying to kill the man, his name um, and his legacy. And I think he's proud to see that everything still lives on uh, the same community that they tried to, to hang. Not only did they hang him on the tree, but they hung the whole community on the tree. And I think that that's powerful mm -hmm. because now his name, the community, has rose up, has risen up, and we're, we're all actively working together for change. And I think he'd be very proud of that. And his name lives on, right? Exactly. <laughs> and, your grand, and your son, too. Yep. That's Fred Rouse III and I have a son, Fred Rouse IV, so his name still lives on. Casey, do you have any more questions from Robbie? No more questions, just a huge thank you and a note of gratitude to each of you for joining us um, today and sharing your stories and your journey and the work that you're engaging in with our, not only our TCU community, but I always say our global community because we know the reach that each of you has in sharing and sharing your stories. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for joining us today. And I know I can speak on behalf of all of our alumni who are watching and will watch this, how grateful we are for the continued work that we will join with you in, in order to continue to move that, what we call it yesterday, Adam, not a pendulum. We're gonna come up with another name. Yeah, because a pendulum justice, swings right? back. <laughs> We're, it's like there's one way. Yeah, it's like fly fishing without the recall. There you yeah. go. I love that analogy right. to see that forward movement and progress towards the change that we all want to see and want to be a part of. So thank you. Thank you. This has been really meaningful. Yes, thank you. Uh, any final comments that you all have to offer? We'll start with you, Ms. Opal. Is that okay? If you do, I'm just saying. Then each of you, I hope you remember to make yourself a committee of one to change somebody who's not on the same page you're on and let's get them busy, get about the business of building our community as one community, not a divided community. And for me, I uh, don't think I could leave with everybody is we all have a voice. Let's just use it. Let's just use it. I think I'll just offer, if you see a problem, go fix it. <laughs> and I want to thank you know you all on my behalf um, for Fred and for Adam for giving me that opportunity to write this story. This has been your project, your baby, for a long time. I haven't written a journalism story since I graduated from TCU. <laughs> uh, but 10 months in this process has taught me so much as a young 20 something year old educator now um, to to be the next fighter and, and, and warrior in our streets. Um, Fred, likewise, for you stepping forward into this this light, right? You didn't have to do that, but you were called to. And I thank God for that. You made that decision. And and I hope that, you know, we continue to stay connected and 
Big Brothers for Life, Miss Opal. Um, you're an inspiration to me, and I'm sure millions of other people. Um, if I can live to the age that you lived, I hope I can just see. You know what I'm saying? And you walk two and a half miles on Juneteenth on a hot day in June. I was right there with you, and that meant a lot. So thank you for your wisdom, your grace, and what you poured into this community. So I'm glad you all could be here today. Thank you for being a part of it. And if all youngsters would understand that this is the way to go. I, I'm wanting to talk to those young people who are in gangs and things. I'm reading a book of poems that were written by pe people in prison and it's heartbreaking where they have turned their lives around. It's heartbreaking to know that they could have been productive citizens. And these youngsters don't have to get that far. They don't have to go to prison. I want to talk to them. Bring them to me. We're on it. <laughs> we got you, Ms. Apple. And so um, to conclude, I just want to thank all the audience members and viewers today across Facebook Live and, and YouTube. Um, though this panel is over, let's keep the discussion going. Um, just talk, share what your thoughts were on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever you use. Go home, talk to your family, talk to your friends, go to work, talk about this and, and what it meant to you. That's going to keep Karen Friend Russ's name. Um, I want to again thank all of our partners for making this possible. Um, of course, our panelists. Um, if you haven't already, check my story out. Of course, I got to pub that right one more time. Um, magazine.tcu.edu and lynching spark change. And if you are a TCU alumni, you got the magazine. It's also there too, never too late to say his name. So thanks for joining us. Take care and as always, go frog.